everyone. This is Cheryl and Daryl Duick. Hello. Welcome to the Hub Online Live. We are here uh, excited to talk to you about, well, we're going to have a wonderful conversation continuing from a month ago about selecting microphones. And we have three wonderful guests that are with us all the way from Kitchener, Ontario. We have Andrew Horrocks. <laughs> Why don't you wave, Andrew? Hey. Andrew is the owner and operator of AME Recording Studio in Kitchener, Ontario. He's a three-time Covenant Award winning producer who has contributed to the landscape of Canadian Christian music by having uh, recorded and produced and contributed to over 250 albums. Wow. And some of the artists he's worked at worked with include Thousand Foot Crutch, Ali Matthews, Jody Cross, Miranda Stone, um, Chris Bray. There's many more. <laughs> Welcome, Andrew. <laughs> Hello. And Good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful to have you. We also have Randy Hits all the way from New York. Randy, why don't you give us a wave? Randy is a music producer, arranger, recording engineer, and the owner of Hits Music Production Studio located in Westbury, New York. He specializes in audio mixing, sound and video installation, and sound recording. He's also a songwriter, an upright bassist, originally trained in classical music, and a self-taught guitarist. Um, when it comes to microphones, he loves to experiment. So we're going to love hearing from him about what he feels about microphones. Welcome, Randy. Thank you for having me. And all the way from California, California, as most people say, <laughs> we have Matthew McGlynn. He is the owner of Mike Parts. Am I correct there, Mike? Uh, Rant, yeah. Ma yeah, Matthew. <laughs> It's short for microphoneparts.com, which was uh, either a really smart company name or the world's worst brand. Uh, <laughs> but we shortened it to Mike Parts because it's less of a mouthful. Excellent. Uh, and Mike Parts, or microphoneparts.com, is a provider of high quality audio components and do it yourself audio kits. Matthew was a drummer first when, uh, when he started out when just seeking out microphones, but he got a love for microphones when he realized that different microphones produce different sounds and change the quality of the recording of his drum set. So that got him really curious. He started co co collecting details about microphones and now is a person that fully understands how microphones work and he creates microphones. He redesigns microphones and you'll find out more. Welcome, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate being here. So it's great to have you guys all here. And the continuation is from last month, just talking about from what a microphone is to now, how do I select a microphone? In our tease that we did earlier today, I held up a speaker going, is this good for my voice? The general question is, what's the best microphone for me? Is there, what's, I, it's a big, broad question. What is the best microphone? It's a loaded question. It is. Do you have a loaded answer? Um, to be honest with you, I have Neumann's, I've got U87, I've got, I've had a bunch of different microphones over the year, years. I have a CAD, CAD E350s, bunch of stuff back there. I have found that everybody, every voice that I've ever dealt with reacts differently. It's really bizarre. It's like a lot of that back there, those preamps back there have a lot to do with it. A lot, it's an intermixing and a balance between what mic you use and also what you're trying to achieve, I feel. Like my, I have these CADs, which are solid states and they give a lot more punchier, like very in your face type of a hit sound to them when you're singing. Now the U U87, everybody knows what that is. There's a very, very, very smooth trans, you know, pretty transparent mic, but it reacts differently to different things. So, and then I've, I've used other microphones just on a lark just to see, well, let's see what this does. Cause I don't believe there should be rules. I think you should bend the recording process because that's when you stumble onto things that are just beautiful. That's my opinion. Andrew, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think it is very dependent on what the the sound source is that you're that you're actually trying to record, and and you um, 
and and you know basically you've got to um, you have to have a basic understanding of the different kinds of microphones, right? Um, that's probably something that you should just share briefly. And and uh, uh, Matthew, perhaps you can add to this. M my three main microphones that I would use in my studio are dynamic microphones like an SM57, uh, condenser microphones like a, a U87, and um, and uh, ribbon microphones uh, like uh, our uh, like a Royer 121. Um, so the, I, I don't have any of any other kinds of microphones. There are microphones like shotgun microphones and different things like that. Um, and what am I, what else am I missing, Matthew, that's important as far as mic style? You know, for typical studio applications, I think you've nailed it. Yeah. Uh, ribbon condenser dynamic are certainly the big three. Um, yeah. And that's going to cover 95% of what most people use. Um, shotgun mics, as you say, have some applications. Um, they're popular for some voiceover things. They're popular on location. You'll also run into uh, like boundary mics, um, uh, which is a, a little omni mic next to a plate. Right. And those are good for stage use sometimes. And P PZM uh, microphones, right? Is that, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Pressure zone microphones, I think they're called. Exactly. Yeah. And so, but those are a specialty thing. And, you know, it's not like you don't see them. I, I was in a studio once years and years and years ago. They had a drum set set up. And in lieu of overheads, they had two Manhasset music stands, which I'm sure everyone knows <laughs> those are, yeah. with a PZM on each. Yeah. That's and it, I saw the stands. I was like, what is, is he reading sheet music from 12 feet away? <laughs> and they said, no, that's the overheads. It's this amazing sound. I was like, wow. And, you know, to Randy's point, experiment. Uh, yeah. You know, if it sounds good, it is good. That's at the end of the day, that's the only rule that really matters. Yeah. Um, but ribbon condenser dynamic, that is the basic three, uh, the only color comment I would add to that is that there's a lot of variation within each of those. Mm -hmm. There are some general um, characteristics of each of those types. Uh, just to throw a little bit out there, uh, dynamic microphones, um, they tend to take a lot of level because of Ooh. just of the way that they're built. And so if you wanted to put a microphone on a snare drum, which is just about the loudest thing any studio ever records, you typically reach for a dynamic. It doesn't mean that a ribbon or a condenser wouldn't work, uh, but dynamics are really robust. They'll take that level all day long. They sound great in that application. Uh, also, because of the relatively high mass of the transducer in the dynamic mic, they tend to pick up less detail. But when you're this far away from a rim shot, you know, there's plenty of detail there. Right. Um, a condenser microphone can be made that small. They tend to have very, very high output. Um, which is great for a lot of things, spoken word, singing, acoustic guitar, classical acoustic guitar, which is, you know, among one of the quieter things that you'd record because they're not very loud and you're usually a couple of feet away. Um, so condensers are great for sensitivity and for high, sen uh, high sensitivity, but also detail. Um, you put that up on a snare drum and it's probably going to overload. It's going to clip inside the mic. And if it doesn't clip inside the mic, it's going to clip your preamp. So yeah, you can pad it. You can pad the mic internally. You can plug in an inline pad to reduce the level before your preamp overloads. But then if the drummer hits it with a stick, it's toast. Mm -hmm. right? And that might oh, probably yeah. cost you three or 400 bucks, whereas a 57 costs you 99. Mm -hmm. And it'll take the stick hit too. So there's different uh, characteristics that follow from the way those mics are built. Um, and so within within the area of dynamics, there's a bunch of choices within the area of ribbons. There's a lot of choices within condensers, especially. Um, I talk about condensers a lot because those will be disproportionately used among those three types. Um, you know, like a, a typical singer songwriter uh, plays a couple of, you know, guitar, banjo, mandolin, like some stringed instruments, maybe some piano singing might never have a need for a dynamic mic. Not to say you couldn't sound good with one, but those, those kinds of instruments and voices can use condensers all day long and you can have a room full of them and they'll all sound different. And that's a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, microphones are like paintbrushes. You know, it's yeah. not that one's better than the other because if I said, uh, you know, I want to paint a, paint a portrait, what's the best color, red or blue? Anyone would look at that and say, it's a ridiculous question. You can't paint a, paint a portrait with either of them and you need blue for some, if you want to paint the sky, guess what? You know, if you want to paint a stop sign so uh so 
all these different kind of microphones have a distinct or have, have their own sound and it's the responsibility of the artist. And this goes back to the original question. Um, what's the best mic for me? No one can answer that except for you. Why? Well, because your voice is unique and your ears are unique. And you can put a singer on a mic and line up three people and say, what's your favorite? And you might get three different answers. It doesn't mean anyone's <laughs> wrong. It means their ears are sensitive, more or less sensitive to certain bands of frequencies that are present or not present in the track. That has to do a lot with the microphone and the room, of course, and the preamp and so on and so forth. But um, ultimately, for the artist to be satisfied, they have to like the sound of their own voice, right? No artist is going to, well, not a lot of artists are going to say, <laughs> I think this track sounds terrible, but I have faith in my engineer. I don't think that, because that, I mean, that's, that's, Never. that engineer isn't going to get hired again, right? The artist has to be happy. And the only way that happens is that you try some microphone and you see what works, works best on your voice, which is a point that Randy made. Try a few different things. They're all going to respond differently. The microphone plays a huge part of that. Uh, the preamp adds color. Uh, in my experience, and, and uh, Andrew and Randy might disagree, and I'd love to hear that perspective, because um, I spend a lot of time building microphones and not quite as much time recording people with them. Um, uh, in my experience, uh, the microphone has a bigger effect on the sound of the track than anything else does. And the way I usually characterize, characterize that is that if you change out the microphone, almost everybody will hear that difference. If you mm -hmm. change out the preamp, 30 to 50% of people will hear that difference. If you change out the converter, five or 10% of the people will hear that difference, right? So in my experience, again, this is just me, as you get further from the sound source, the relative contribution of the piece of gear diminishes. Matthew, what would you say, uh, uh, two microphones, do they, all, do they fall under the condenser category as well? Uh, they do. Even though, even though they usually come with a power supply, they don't need phantom power, but they're, they're under the banner of condensers as well. They are, yeah. yeah. The, you know, yeah. the way condenser mics work uh, is they have one of these inside. So that is a microphone capsule. So uh, they don't always look like this, but this is a very, very common example of a condenser mic capsule. And this has to be followed by a circuit. The circuit needs power. Uh, a, a solid state mic or a FET mic, as they're sometimes called, will run on phantom power from your mixer or your preamp. Um, a tube microphone won't do that because the tube itself needs 120 to 300 volts. And you can, it's, it's hard to derive enough power out of phantom power to drive a tube circuit. It has been done. Uh, Audio Technica had a phantom power tube mic years ago. Um, but, uh, but the similarity is that tube mics typically would have one of these inside as well, as opposed to, you know, a ribbon motor, which I happen to also have, because this is a paperweight on my desk. Uh, I'll take this out. So this is a form of dynamic mic. So this is actually a kind of junky uh, ribbon motor. So the thing that's corrugated in the middle is the actual ribbon. It's a very, very thin piece of aluminum mm -hmm. surrounded by magnets. Um, and these don't necessarily need a circuit after. They just need a transformer because the signal coming off of this is minuscule. So they have a step-up transformer that r gains up the, the signal, basically. And then the other big type, the other common type that we've been talking about is a dynamic, which I don't have one handy, but um, it's, it's, well, yeah, hold up your speaker I, again, basically. Well, yeah, I have one right here, a dynamic microphone. But if you hold up your speaker again, that's actually like a macro version of a dynamic microphone cartridge. Mm -hmm. So it's a magnet and a coil of wire and a pole piece and a diaphragm, and the, the speaker mm -hmm. cone is the diaphragm. And so if you wire that up, as you know, and you shout into it, it's a microphone. Uh, a dynamic microphone works exactly the same way. Um, so it does not need circuitry, doesn't need phantom power, but it doesn't have much output level either. So, hey, on a very practical uh, uh, plane here, you probably have, there's probably people who, um, there you go, the most famous <laughs> dynamic microphone of all. And it substitutes as a ball peen hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, I think when um, Daryl was asking that question too, he's sort of fishing. You know, he he knows that we're going to say what we just What's said. Just to argue, <laughs> but, right? But but he's sort of he's kind of fishing to to see uh, to hear like a practical answer about uh, maybe what we think is a nice and expensive microphone that uh, that's good good quality for for a singer. You know, because there's there's people here uh, who are watching who who might consider buying a condenser, but they have no idea where to start. 
So I'll just yeah. throw something super practical at you guys. Um, I have a client. Uh, her name is Mireille Pruneau, and she's from Quebec. And um, she would often drive down to Kitchener and spend a, a weekend or a week here or whatever, and we would record. But because of COVID, um, we we talked about how she, I'd you know we wanted her to record her vocals at home. So um, she did a little bit of uh, you know a little bit of uh, exploration as to what microphone she might get and what kind of interface, and um, you know but she was completely confused. So I, I basically you know told her of a couple of microphones um, that I'm uh, familiar with. Um, uh, one is a um, uh, an Aston, uh, I think it's, uh, what is it called? Uh, an Origin, I think, an Aston Origin, and it retails for about 400 bucks. Um, mm -hmm. It's a British-made microphone. It's a fairly new brand, and, uh, and, and also, you know, one that a lot of people own that's in that same price range is the Rode uh, NT1A. And, um, you know, f for somebody who's just going to start out and they don't want to break the bank, like, uh, you know, um, uh, Randy and I both have Neumann U87s and they cost, you know, 3,500 bucks brand new and nobody's going to want to spend that. Right. Um, unless right. you're in a studio, but, uh, so th there's a, there, there's a couple there. Uh, I would recommend probably both of those. Uh, and she also bought, um, the scar, the, you know, the Scarlet interface with the, the focus, right, uh, preamps. And, and so, uh, we just finished the song and it worked out really great. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I had to train her a little bit about, you know, where, you know, it's so important where she uh, sings from the microphone, you know, you know, you've got to train people to uh, your singers to make sure that they're delivering their, their vocal uh, properly. Um, but, but she was great. And, and she, she really took to it and she had a riot. She had, uh, I think it was really satisfying for her to buy a microphone, buy an interface and, um, you know, and actually, um, and actually have it work uh, on, a, on her single. So I don't know about you guys, but uh, th that's just my rec real practical recommendations for a couple of like $400-ish microphones. Well, I'll, I'll t go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say that, that is awesome. We're, we're starting to already get questions from our audience, but I also just wanted to remind the audience that we are here, this is Studio Talk Hub Online, and that we are talking to three fabulous panelists right now about selecting microphones. We have Andrew Horrocks from Kitchener, Ontario, Randy Hitz from New York, and we have Matthew McGlynn from California. Eh? <laughs> um, and um, Randy and Andrew are producers as well as, um, well, recording engineers, if I can call them, is that the correct terminology, I hope? Mm -hmm. And Matthew is actually a microphone designer. So um, we hope that you are learning from this and listen, guys, share the experience, okay? Share the experience. There are people that, that need to know these, this bit of information, not because they're going to go and have their own studio, but just the fact that they have the knowledge behind, just in case they want to buy their own microphone for their own purposes. So go ahead, share the experience. And can I interject yes. a, a, a question? We have a question from the audience. Basically, and I think part of it has already been answered, but it was to, to define again the difference and, and the purposes of the ribbon mic um, actually, specifically, it's what does a ribbon mic do? And well, that, that's, I'll tell you one thing, ribbon mics can be really beautiful. I mean, even a lot of times I see a lot of people using ribbons for acoustics and, and delicate instruments. But I also see them being used on amplifiers. If you can handle the SPL, if you move them back into a, you know, into a room to get a bit of room. Um, I had a buyer um years ago and i i set that up in a room a little bit back from the amp because the, the ribbon can't handle the the load like a dynamic can. and it was it sounded amazing for the for that but uh, i mean i mean you guys can interject as far as you know your uses for ribbons but i mean they, they have such a if you find the right one that can be really useful and really beautiful in a general sense, ribbon microphones have a softer top end. So they, 
they typically mm -hmm. kind of roll off the top end a little bit. Um, and it, one really, uh, like we all have our own experiences, right? We all have our clients that we, we've worked with. And so we get to, so this is just my experience with, uh, um, I, I have a, a client who's a violinist and, um, and basically a, a ribbon microphone like this one, um, I'll show you. Uh, this is a, an, an uh, R, what is it? An RCA 4033 or 4030 or something like that. I think it's 4030. And um, so it has a warmer top end. So with, with violin, you know, the stereotypical violin is the scratchy top end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and a ribbon microphone is uh, kind of allows the wood, the woodiness of the, of the, of the violin to sort of speak more and it sort of softens up the, the, some of the extraneous noise and the sort of scratchy sound. So the cool thing is, is that when you use a, a, a ribbon microphone and you capture it, um, uh, you know, you, you kind of get a, even though you can do some of those EQ things later um, in post, um, it sure gives you a really great start and, and right away um, the, the instrument feels better. Um, and and uh, uh, Randy was talking about uh, about on guitar amplifiers. I have a story. That same microphone that I <laughs> that I just showed up, I put that too close to a guitar cabinet, and it cost me. I remember exactly four hundred and thirty four dollars <laughs> uh, to repair it. Um, yeah, you got to be it, careful. It was. It had to be sent back to England. That's a. It's a British made microphone, and so yeah, it cost me. And it was like a really dumb mistake. I think I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that said, the Royer 121 um, is a ribbon microphone, and it was built to withstand a lot more sound pressure level. And so a lot of guys do a 57 and a Royer 121 on guitar cabinets, or a 57 and a, a Fathead. I forget what the what the make is, but Cascade. Um, oh yeah, Cascade Fathead. Those are sort of the two famous combinations at this point for guitar amps, but. Yeah, wonderful, no, uh, wonderful sound too. Have you ever, huh. you guys ever used uh, ribbon microphones for room microphones? Sure. At all? Yeah, that that's another great great use for them because again, it, it warms it up and it gives you a, just sort of a different vibe. But yeah, but it's all about the you know at the end of the day we talk about this stuff, but it's all about the performance, right? You mm -hmm. know, um, just the way we were, I think the way all three of us were going at the beginning was that we were we sort of didn't want to say oh this is better or this is worse because at the end of the day we're acknowledging that performance is everything and you could if if you have a great vocal and you recorded it on an sm57 it doesn't really matter if it you know if it if it sucks it sucks <laughs> you know so i so, haven't had i haven't had much luck recording uh vocals with ribbon microphones they, they don't they don't seem to be articulate enough for vocals for me but that maybe for jazz or something so like a smoky sort of sound but it depends on the ribbon um two things to watch out for for people who want to experiment is ribbons have a lot of proximity effect which means as you get closer they can get really thick mm. to the point of being muddy um and uh and so if if you sing into a ribbon from the same distance that you use singing into a condenser microphone which is to say you know, four to eight inches, it might just be really thick. So the proximity effect that's exaggerated combined with the softer top end means you're going to get this kind of saturated woolly sound, depending on the voice. So you can back up from the ribbon. Um, you can try to do some low frequency roll off uh, in, in your mixer or in the DAW later. You can add some high frequency EQ to bring back some of that clarity and some of the air. Um, the, the challenge with backing off to reduce proximity is that then you're picking up a lot more of the room. So in a typical bedroom studio, that moving away from the ribbon isn't going to work well because then you're hearing the entire space, which in typical bedrooms doesn't sound good. Um, so, uh, and then there are some ribbons that are just brighter. There's, there's ways to make ribbon microphones brighter. Um, mm -hmm. So some designs, uh, it is generally true what you said, that the top end is, is softer. It's just, they sound dark on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um, Which isn't necessarily bad. No, it's not. If you have a drummer that's bashing cymbals, um, putting up ribbons as overheads lets you hear the cymbals without taking your face off. Right. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's and why also, I'm deaf today. <laughs> it's also a, a matter of uh, what you get used to. Um, but for people who are interested in uh, 
hearing some ribbon mics uh, on the Recording Hacks website, which is a website that I put together as I was discovering this world of microphones. Um, we did a, a shootout called the $60,000 ribbon mic shootout. <laughs> we had uh, $60,000 uh, worth of microphones and it's all online at recordinghacks.com. And so we had uh, mics from AEA, Audio-Technica, Biodynamic, Blue, Cascade, Cloud, Coles, uh, RCA, Royer, a lot of Royers, uh, SC Electronics and on and on. Anyway, we had like 40 different microphones and we did them on, on sax, we did them on drum overheads, did them on acoustic yeah. guitar. Um, we had a, a voice actor from Disney called, uh, I think his name was Corey Burton, um, do character voices, uh, which was really a trip um, to mm. hear. And it, there was an interesting historical tie-in because Disney animators in the 40s and 50s used ribbon microphones. Right. And so he's, he's a big fan personally of those kinds of mics and he has a collection of his own. But um, anyway, funny. so it's all online and you can download the sound files and you can hear, you know, 40 different ribbon mics on five different sources. So because if you listen to the voiceovers from those movies they were very warm yeah if you think about it i'm i'm an old school looney tunes fan so like i <laughs> you know <laughs> that's how i got through my childhood but that's a whole nother story but but you know it's it's you, from back then i mean well everything was tube too anyway all the praise were all tubes and everything like some of these lovely babies back here but well um, tape too uh -huh. yeah and tape, tape. yeah and all of it tape. yeah sorry i didn't mean to step on anybody no, no, no. but it was just interesting you said that because you, you think about that quality of tone and there was a lot of richness that's one thing i have a hard time with it. today in today's mindset with with the daw and everything else i'm just jumping a little bit off topic with the mics the preamps are really crucial now mm -hmm. too. i agree i am yeah. a tube man through and through um, there's a couple of Poltex back here that came out of Electric Lady Studios that are on loan to me. Wow. They're not mine. They, I, I wish I, there's actually a doodle from Jimi Hendrix on one of them, actually. It's pretty <laughs> wild. Great. It's like, yeah. but um, I track and I get it as close as I can because I have a small space and then I retrack through the Poltex and stuff to get everything dialed in. The why I want it. But I was to, on something that Matthew was talking about. I know there's a lot of thing about imaging and the thing with the microphones is I, you know, you're saying when you're starting off, you don't have a lot of money. You need, you know, the focus, right? This, the lower end Scarlet pre's and stuff and all them are not bad at all. In fact, you're hearing one right now because <laughs> that's what this microphone is going through, <laughs> but it's, you, it's an, I found a years cause I came from live sound and the biggest hurdle I had to jump through when I got into recording, other than trying to get money to get equipment, was trying to get preamps that sounded worth a darn. And it, the environment of the computer has really, I mean, nowadays things are a lot more transparent and a lot more full bandwidth, but to get that real smooth punch, I think it's still very, very hard to do these days unless you really know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? In the final stages of your recordings. And I miss that, you know, um, but I digress. So yes, and well, I don't know, did you get any questions from anybody about price points? What they're looking to spend? What kind of money? We should probably tell them about ribbon prices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, because- Well, the know, MXL has them for $100. Uh, who, what's that? Isn't it MXL has them for like $100, $125 for some entry level ones? Um, I, I think this one is what? 17 maybe? Or, well, I'm talking Canadian dollars. So that's, uh, it's probably. That's, that's a 4038, right? Cole's 4038. Those are amazing. Yeah. And then my Royer, my Royer ribbon is 1500 bucks. Um, but as you guys pointed out, the good old SM57, hundred bucks. <laughs> so, oh, and you know, I, I wanted to just also just make a quick comment. Um, uh, you know, uh, Randy was holding up the SM57 before. I mean, the SM58, uh, right? Right. And right. it's well worn. I just I just uh, recorded and mixed a a live uh, a live album where the the lead vocal was an SM basically an SM58 capsule right and um we basically i brought the 
uh, some of the lead singers back into the studio and we um, and we retracked some of the, a few of the lead vocals and we used vocal align to line it line the sync up with the, the video because it was a live DVD as well and uh, but holy smokes an SM58 sounds amazing like like they they can they if you you know you can dial it in and once it's in the track and uh, with the right uh, treatment an SM58 is a pretty cool microphone so that that's always I wouldn't commit to uh, necessarily doing you know a demo like or doing something that you're going to release on a 58 but holy smokes demoing and everything buy an SM58 and uh, and just just be smart about it and, um, but it's yeah. also got a lot to do with the nut behind the wheel yeah I mean, the person yeah. engineering that show, if he doesn't know what he's doing, it's going to be real rough later on. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've done live, I did a lot of live recordings from shows that I used to mix. Yeah. And I had a Midas desk and a 58. Yeah. And, you know, it was, you know, if you know what you're doing, you're going to get good quality yeah. out, of, so out of those things. I would, uh, <laughs> so the risk of, of these kinds of uh, conversations is that, <laughs> people on this screen can throw f a five thousand dollar signal chain at every vocal and it's going to sound great because yeah. you guys know what you're doing and you've got gear for days mm -hmm. but the takeaway for the people watching shouldn't be that you have to have the zillion dollar mic and then you exactly. made the tube pre and the pull tech and the 40 years of experience whatever uh i think we'd all agree that it's better to buy the 99 dollar dynamic mic and the $99, uh, you know, USB interface, whether it's a Scarlet or a little Mackie or a Personas or whatever, it's better to have that $200 signal chain and record the damn song than to spend your life not recording because you're saving for the next yeah. piece of gear. Yeah, right? I agree, so 100%. Point A, you know, get what you can afford and get busy because until you learn, you know, how to sing into the mic, to learn how to how to record, how to mix, mic technique, those sorts of things. I mean, you're going to get better. And if you walk into an amazing studio uh, with no technique, then you're not going to get great results anyway. Yeah. So 100%. do what you can do with what you can afford. Mm -hmm. Second point I wanted to make is um, when you're ready to upgrade beyond the $200 signal chain, there are a lot of microphones out there that will give you a better sound. Um, you know, there are good quality entry level ish condensers in that sort of three to $500 range that will give you an amazing sound through, you know, a consumer grade preamp, not to say it can't get better, but it will be very, very good. Uh, what I would caution you about though, is to try it first because uh, like I said before, microphones are like paintbrushes and they all have a slightly different color to them or sometimes a significantly different color. But the one, the one that you need to look out for is the one that's too bright and too Ooh. harsh. Now, not every singer is going to trigger this, but if the microphone has an exaggerated high end, and unfortunately, a lot of the microphones in the sub $500 price category do mm -hmm. tend to be overly bright, that uh, mixes with voices really badly in some cases. And so every time you say an S or a P or a T sound, yeah. you'll get this exaggerated, really sharp transient and it will overload your converters and cause distortion and you can't fix that in the mix it's already buried in your track and it won't go away mm -hmm. so um so what you need to do uh, it, it depends on where your sibilance is you know some some singers are sibilant some more than others and every microphone has a presence boost somewhere and so if that presence boost in the mic lines up with where your voice is naturally sibilant that microphone's going to sound harsh so uh so you have to try them and what i used to always recommend was that people who are shopping for a microphone, don't know what to do, go into the local studio and pay the, you know, 30, 40 bucks an hour for a couple hour session and just try everything that they have in the, in their locker. Uh, now with, with the pandemic, I'm not sure that's uh, feasible anymore. Um, but if you can figure out any way to borrow or rent microphones uh, or buy with a return policy and try them on your own voice in your own studio, uh, that's really, the best way to end up being satisfied is to actually try it before you commit. And it's also helping to train your ears on top of that, because that's mm -hmm. the bottom line is he's got great points. The, the bottom line is learning how to record because I was a live engineer. When I went into the studio, started recording, it's a whole different animal. It's no longer about room, about trying to correct a mix to a room. 
it's now trying to image a recording. And um, has anybody, you were talking about Rhodes. I used to, I had a pair of NTKs. Did you remember mm -hmm. that, Mike? Mm -hmm. It was an interesting microphone below $500. Mm -hmm. It was a tube, it's a tube microphone. It's a little on the dark side, but it wasn't that bad. But like I said, I mean, it all depends on the budget. That's why I was asking if anybody was talking about money, how much could they afford to spend? Because the one thing about the role. You know, one thing I wanted to mention too about tube microphones is that um, if people are trying to make a decision on, you know, let's say, let's say that um, they are go uh, they are going to kind of save some money and they are going to make that purchase of that little bit better microphone, right? Um, uh, and uh, and I think it's important that perhaps uh, you guys can correct me if, if, you, if I'm if you don't agree, but that they actually don't buy a tube microphone as their only like their main microphone because mm -hmm. tubes can die and they and they do it over time and you know you you uh, you don't want to find yourself in a place where you've just recorded your whole you know your whole album or recorded an album for somebody and then at the end you're going is this microphone darker or is it a little bit distorted? You know what I mean? Mm. The, the, that's always a risk. I, like I love tube microphones and I have a, a Rode Classic 2, which is a, a, a beautiful uh, tube mic and I use it all the time. But um, I always I, I always have my U87, no matter what goes, like if my U87 goes down, I have the other one. If my Rode goes uh, you know, down, I just, it, it's all good because I, I still have a U87 transformer based in it it's fairly stable so but um hey there was one point. thing there was one thing i wanted to mention too about a ribbon microphones too I, I wanted to ask you guys have you ever used one of these before it's yeah, all the time aren't they amazing yeah I, uh, i've seen that and believe it or not i've never used it I've, it's called a cloud lifter so so ribbon microphones are typically lot lower power so you gotta crank your preamp so that you're you're induce, you're bringing noise into a sig the signal path these things what is it like 20 db or 25 db they there's a they they bring um uh with the use of phantom power uh, uh they bring a ribbon microphone up to a real nice strong signal and, and they're great they kind of open up these are actually really fun to use on dynamic microphones too yeah. um so yeah they're anyway this is a cool trick that pod lifters 150 bucks something like that probably yeah those are and now those are i'm great. gonna buy more gear after we leave yeah. this <laughs> thank you okay. yeah so i'm gonna but, jump in here if you don't mind i'd like to go back to uh a question i'll throw to andrew and, and to randy is when you're selecting microphones for your clients what makes you choose one microphone over the other i'm well i honestly try out I don't necessarily just, well, I listen to the person singing. If they have a very full, rich voice, it's a little bit easier to deal with. If somebody's got a more sharp voice, you know, then you, you, you got to try to stick with the, the microphones that are a little bit darker to kind of help that out. And we can EQ and compress and do all sorts of fun things. But I mean, I, like I said, I've done some really unorthodox things with recording vocals. And until I do a little bit of sample tracking, because sometimes what I think works, and then I, I, we drop some, we we drop a track, you know, a take, and then all of a sudden I'm like, eh, this is not doing anything for me. So I just keep switching out mics. The first, like the first time I work with somebody, I'll bring them in and say, listen, we're gonna just spend a little time. I'm not gonna charge you for this. We're just gonna work with you. I want to try try to find something that's gonna be nice. We'll spend a little time extra time i do that um and like i said it's never any set my i mean the ua7 is a great fallback for everybody and anything but it's not necessarily always the answer so the question is is what do you do to choose a microphone for your clients when they walk in to sing what, what's the steps what's your procedure well when you've got microphones as good as uh like you know if you've got a two or three thousand dollar microphones Typically, you, you're you're fair, you're usually very confident that you know I've used this on you know ten people in the last you know this last year and it sounds great on everybody, but once in a while it's it's the wrong microphone even though it's worth worth two or three thousand dollars. So uh, I basically kind of um, 
uh, and sometimes uh, there's there's one rule too, or uh, a thought that females uh, have have maybe a little brighter vocal, typically. So you 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 can go with a darker uh, a darker microphone, and maybe guys who have a darker sound can can afford a brighter microphone. But like like uh, Randy said at the beginning, there's no rules, right? But um, so I basically would just put up one of my good microphones, and if I suddenly, if I feel um, uh, that it's like, whoa, this isn't sounding like I know it's supposed to sound, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll change up to the other one, basically. And what I might do is I'll record, and if I'm kind of hedging a little bit, I'll record one pass of each of my best. I, I've got an, an um, Telefunken AK-47 as well. Oh, so, so jealous. So sometimes, so sometimes I'll do a pass of, of maybe two of those mics, and then I'll invite the client in and I'll say, hey, which one do you like the best? Which one do you, do you feel is, is you more? And usually they, uh, usually they have an opinion, I think. But so, so I, I do that. But if you've got them at the right distance away from the microphone and you've got them singing properly, again, you've got to educate them. Because if, if you've got somebody who keeps you know, singing off axis or, or, mm -hmm. or singing too far away or doing, you know, you've got to say, plant your feet and um, you know, and and don't be walking around while you're singing. You know, you just gotta, <laughs> you've gotta be, you've gotta make sure that stuff is right. Because just like anything that you record, whether it's a snare drum or a guitar or a vocal, what's happening at the sound source is the most important thing, right? So for a singer, gosh, there's there's the whole emotional thing of uh, of making sure a singer feels like they're gonna be able to do a good job. So if you have to take 15 minutes and uh and and just like i i remember having a, a a client who they were totally not getting the vibe of the song even though i think they wrote the song but i couldn't in words get them to do what i wanted them to do so i said come on in here we're listening to uh what was it um a, a christina aguilera song so i said okay you got to hear this gospely christina aguilera song called pray and it's just killer and she's you know, and you can't listen to that as a singer and, and kind of not go, oh, okay, I guess that's what singing is about. So, you, you know, you inspire them to be present on the microphone, you get them at the right distance, and hopefully it's going to work after that, right? And, uh, yeah, so th that would be my, my method, I think. That's so good. I just want to remind some viewers again that if you are just joining us, um, we're here, Hub Online Studio Talk, talking about how to select a microphone. And I hope that uh, for those of you who've been sticking with us, that you are learning quite a lot from Andrew Horrocks and Randy Hitz, who are studio um, owners and producers, as well as Matthew McGlynn, who is a, a microphone designer and the microphone maker. So I hope you're tuning in and I hope you are sharing the experience because guys, this is something that I'll just say this knowledge is power. I know someone said that knowledge is power. And this is something that you could know so that next time you go and, and research mics or go, go to a studio and look for mics that you can have a more informed idea of what works best for you. We're going to take it back to the conversation. <laughs> so you keep saying something, uh, when I listen to the person singing through the mic, if it doesn't sound right, what are you actually listening for to sounds right or doesn't sound right? Is it a color? Is it a frequency thing? Is it? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's can, all of the above. Can, can you elaborate. elaborate on that so that? You know, so what's funny is it's like you'll sit there and you can listen to somebody speak or sing in front of you. Okay. My opinion, unless you're trying to go for a specific effect, is when you're trying to record somebody, you would want to get the voice that you're hearing, as long as it's good, of course, <laughs> to sound as close to what you hear sitting in front of you on tape. I'm an old school guy, sorry. So you want that exact presence and imaging to go down on the recording. If I record somebody and I'm listening back to what I'm hearing and it just sounds, it doesn't sound, the phasing's not right. The tone doesn't sound 
It doesn't sound like equalization. It doesn't sound warm enough. It doesn't sound bright enough. It doesn't, if it doesn't, if it's not imaging well, that's another thing that's really bizarre that I've learned over the years. If it's just not sitting well, that it, it, it's, I can't explain that in a technical term, it's just something, an instinct from listening. But honestly, if you're not, if you're hearing somebody's voice this way and you're hearing it different on that, on the recording, something's up. That's, that's when I start going, we may want to try something different. That's actually a, a good, like a rule of thumb when you're recording pretty much anything is that you, you, you go up to it with your ear, especially with acoustic instruments. There's always sort of a sweet spot. There's a, there's a place on a guitar where the sound is resonating the, you know, the, maybe the purest or the most uh, uh, pretty or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it isn't always, you know, you think it's right in front of the, the sound hole, but it's not necessarily. Um, it's not that it couldn't be, but to, so you've got to literally, you got to get your, your, your guitar player to sit down, play his guitar, and you get your ear right up to the guitar and you move around. And, and also, but that's the same thing with, with singers too. You know, you, you've got to know, like if, if they walk into the booth and they just start singing and then, uh, and then maybe you, you go in later and you go, holy smokes, are you ever loud or are you ever quiet? That, uh, you know, or, or but, wow, I can really hear the, the presence and the breathiness in your voice. Um, you know, that's the stuff that you only know if you hear it acoustically. And um, yeah, so anyway, I mean, there's, there's more to it than that, but that's always a good thing to do is to, is to listen in, in the room. And um, yeah. I would add one thing to that. Um, I think it's hard for lay people to, to record themselves and listen and, um, and be able to form an opinion about uh, if that sounds good or bad. Because A, they're not used to hearing their own voice typically, but B, they have no idea if it's, uh, if, if whatever their voice does sound like was captured appropriately. But what can really open that up is to have two microphones um, and try it with both. And then you can say, ah, now this one has a better low end. I'm getting more mm. weight on the bottom. Or this one is really sharp and sibilant on top, or this one makes me sound kind of nasal and colored. And all of those things can be valid sounds, you know, because microphones all sound different and, and they sound different because of the way the kinds of components that are in them. And, you know, uh, Andrew, I think you said you had a, a, an AK-47. Um, that's a, a Telefunken uh, tube mic that has a, uh, a certain kind of capsule in it. Uh, yeah. called a K47 capsule. And that kind of capsule has a presence bump around four to five kilohertz, which is not found in a K67 capsule or a CK12 capsule, for example. So these are the you know main capsule types in large diaphragm condensers. But uh, that capsule contributes to a sound that you can't really get any other way. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be the perfect sound for every voice. But when it is the perfect sound, it's magic. Mm -hmm. Which is why when you go into a recording studio, uh, you don't see, uh, you know, one microphone on a stand under a spotlight and, you know, the chorus of angels playing. <laughs> there isn't one best microphone. Right. Yeah. Uh, you go into a great studio, you open the locker, and there's 30 of those different yeah. microphones. And uh, the engineer will reach for whatever makes sense based on what he's, he or she's hearing. And um, So, yeah, anyway, to get back to the point, uh, comparing two things can really help. And uh, the uh, it, my experience has been, uh, that that's really revealing to people because it not only, it's not so much about pick which one is better. I mean, that's a natural consequence of any kind of comparison, but it's also really educational. So it's training your ear about what to listen for. And mm -hmm. so you listen to the track and you break it down in terms of high frequencies, middle frequencies, low frequencies. There's also other things that are harder to describe, but if you start getting into uh, uh, gear with vacuum tubes in it, uh, it's more common with tube gear, you don't need to have a tube to make this happen, but um, you can get some uh, even order harmonic distortion uh, or coloration or texture. Um, so a lot of vintage gear is known for that. And it's, it's not a frequency thing. It's a, it's a kind of a grit or a texture uh, that can happen when you have a microphone that creates that sort of even order harmonic uh, content. So th those are the kinds of things you can listen for, uh, but it's hard to do in a vacuum. So you need to have a couple things to compare to. Mm. Uh as a rule of thumb, you you want to capture a robust 
full frequency, warm, not kind of signal from, from a vocalist, right? You don't want it to be, you want it to be bright. You don't want it to be muffly, but you don't want it to be, um, you know, taking your head off on, on the sibilant and stuff. So you just go for as warm and robust as, and full sounding as possible. And then in post, if you've got this really great solid signal, you can do so much with EQ and compression and, and, and manipulate it into, into uh, the way it's supposed to sound in a track. Um, cause I'm always thinking about what's going to go after. Like I, I always, I'm always thinking about the, the end uh, result, uh, you know, n knowing kind of what I can do in mixing. Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, and the, the technology affords us some pretty crazy microphone options as well. Uh, I, this might be sacrilege, Matthew, but ha, do you know um, much about the Slate microphones where they have that sort of neutral microphone and then you can model all kinds of different kinds of microphones? That's, yeah, a, sure. that's, a, yeah. that's, that's a really interesting concept if you want to go that way, right? Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a big wide open door for sure. Yeah, I think that's, that can make sense for a uh, recording studio. Yeah. where you'd, you'd love to have 30 microphones, but there's no way you to can't afford, afford it. Yeah. You, buy, you buy one of these virtual microphone systems and it gives you like a, a digital representation of what those microphones actually sounded like. I think, mm -hmm. I, I personally think those make less sense for a singer because it's unlikely that any given singer is gonna need even 10 different microphones. You're gonna need two or three that suit your voice. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and for a lot of home musicians too, it makes more sense to have uh, more than one microphone. Like I, you know, I don't want to have, you know, like what if someone said you can have 30 microphones, but you can only ever use one at a time. Is that, that's, I'm not sure that I want to spend money on that. Right. I'd rather have two or three that I could use at the same time. Yeah. I, I, that's exactly the argument that a couple of people that I, uh, that I talked to about that. Uh, Cause I was not a big fan of sing. I, I like doing a lot of this stuff out of the box. I really like to get the track as pure and as solid to, to go. Plus, I'm getting lazy in my old age. I don't like mixing and having to work for it. You know, I, I don't want to have to add a ton of effects and a ton of processing. After That's that. the funnest part, though. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> the ear fatigue, you know? It's like, it's just, I like to, the tracks are really rock solid. Let's get in there. Let's work with the faders. Let's get our leveling in pop the effects on it that we need to get and get it out. But that's just me, you know, what do I know? So Matthew, I'm gonna go back to a comment you said about the build. How much is the the build quality going to affect the sound uh, of a microphone if you take two of the same capsules? Ah, uh, well, build quality is a huge, huge factor. And earlier you mentioned, um, uh, a very inexpensive company, a very inexpensive ribbon microphone that's $100 or something. And then you, you mentioned the Royer 121. And so those are good examples of opposite ends of the, both the price spectrum and the quality spectrum. So in a ribbon mic, um, I showed this ribbon motor before, but uh, it's, it's a good prop for this because this is a, like a ribbon microphone. I, I'll clarify that a passive ribbon microphone is a very, very simple device. It has two components in it. It's got one of these and a transformer and that's it. So if either one of those is subpar, your microphone sucks. There's no way around that. And uh, within this ribbon motor, um, I mean, it's not that complicated, right? It's a little piece of corrugated aluminum in the middle and a couple of magnets and then screens on the front and back. So, uh, and you, you, you can search online and find people making this from a piece of uh, the wrapper from around a piece of Wrigley's chewing gum, right? <laughs> That's not going to make a nice microphone because in, in something this, this seemingly simple, everything matters. So the number of corrugations per inch and the force with which those corrugations are imposed on the metal, the thickness of the metal ribbon, the straightness of it. So I know uh, one guy who makes boutique ribbon microphones and if he needs something that's that long, which is, you know, two, two and a half inches, he will corrugate an eight inch strip of <laughs> aluminum in order to cut out the two or three inches that is the straightest because there's no way to put, and this stuff is, is to call it paper thin would be to be exaggerating in the wrong direction. This stuff is so thin you could just about uh, blow through it. Uh, you can't wow. blow through it. And so when you squish that between two gears, which are precision ground and cost, you know, a thousand or $2,000 for the tool set, um, 
the metal wants to wiggle. So he'll corrugate an eight inch section to cut out the two or three inches that is the straightest. And then the gap between the ribbon and the magnet, uh, which is enough that you can see light through, but not a lot more than that. If it's not consistent top to bottom, because the magnet face isn't ground and machined properly, that makes a difference. Um, the distance around the ribbon from front to back affects frequency response. So all of this stuff matters. And at the end of the day, if you can knock this into transformer and the housing and the grill and the shock mount and the case out of your factory for 40 bucks or, you know, so that, so the distributor can, can get 20 and then the, the dealer can get 30 or 40 and get it out the door for a hundred or a hundred and a quarter, then everything is so compromised that you're just not going to get great results. So a company like Royer makes these right. Uh, and there are other companies as well. Uh, AEA makes great ribbon mics in, in Southern Cal as well, just to name one. But um, to get all of this stuff right just costs money. It costs labor and it costs, uh, you know, expert machine machinists time. Uh, you need big machines to do this kind of work right. So, um, so build quality totally matters. Um, very much so in, in a ribbon microphone, but also in, in condensers. Uh, the tolerances matter, the quality of materials matter. Uh, the amount of care matters. I mean, um, you know, we, we work with the, uh, our suppliers for parts pretty closely on, uh, on, on meeting our specifications for performance, but we test everything because if it's going to go out with my name on it, it has to be great. And so, uh, there is a process where we'll test everything and take this one and set it aside and say, this one doesn't pass spec and we're going to rebuild that one. And, uh, and until it does. And so, um, but you, you can't do that for free. You can't do it for $149 a unit uh, at a retail, you know, at a retail level. So uh, build quality totally matters and it, and it costs money. Okay. Because we're speaking about build quality, what are a couple things that the, the singer songwriter should avoid when they're looking at buying a microphone? So I don't know that that's something that, the typical singer songwriter can can really know um i think uh i think at that level well i'll say it this way um some people here are probably familiar with uh uh produce like a pro it's warren hewitt's uh youtube channel um so he's a he's in southern cal and he's recorded a bunch of bands and he's got a very popular youtube channel and a whole recording academy but um I've had a, a number of conversations with him and, and we've kind of agreed that the entry level point for a really good condenser mic is about 300, uh, 300, 350 dollars. I think below that you're probably compromising quality. Um, and it's, it, it might, it's build quality for sure, but it's also uh, sound quality. Um, above that price point, uh, you're probably pretty safe, but you should still check reviews. Um, it is, especially nowadays, impractical to as, and I realize I just recommended doing this not 15 minutes ago, but it's it's somewhat impractical to demo things in your own home. Um, so, uh, but you can people can go out and read reviews, uh, and and a good microphone review would be where the the person who writes it actually uses the microphone on a bunch of sources and then writes about how it worked on those sources. Mm. Not all reviewers do that. I've had people who basically write something up. It, it's not clear that they ever took the mic out of the box. Um, when I was working on the Recording Hacks project, uh, which is this website that I did, this basically like Wikipedia for microphones, um, I read thousands of mic reviews and you could completely tell where the person phoned it in, uh, you know, pulled a quote out of the press release, wrote about the features that he saw on the website. I mean, did he ever have the microphone? It's not clear that he did. Um, so look at reputable sources for that. Recording Magazine's a great one. Tape Op Magazine's a great one. Uh, Sound on Sound is a great one. Um, yes, a lot of those, good. maybe all of those reviews are online. Those guys do a really good job um, test driving your gear and they'll tell you, you know, what it's good for, what it's not as good for. And um, I think that's, I think that's a requirement for, for picking good stuff. Okay. So did you get anybody as far as ask the question is about how much they have, have to spend because that all that's because I'm sure there's all these people going, yeah, that's all nice and well, but I can't afford any of this. <laughs> you know, I'm really curious if you got any of those questions because I, I, I do have to say, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to promote anything, but I, I've heard a lot of the cheap interfaces 
like the Barringers, the Mackies, the Fogelstroids. And honestly, to be honest with you, as entry point, I'm fairly impressed with any, um, uh, the Scarlet line. I'm actually shocked at how well it sounds for what it is, for the money. And if you're just starting off, you can't hurt yourself by getting those. The, the, the converters are pretty decent for, for a cheap interface. I was quite surprised at how they sound. Um, now everybody has their own opinion, but also stability too, like some of the other ones <clears throat> with my partner in my radio, our Streamcast show, he had one of the Behringer ones and it kept hanging up on him. So it's like, you know, your build quality on those, the cheaper ones too, you gotta worry about stability. And the last thing you wanna do, ladies and gentlemen, and when you first start recording, is having equipment that keeps failing on you because that is one of the things that will drive you into stop recording quicker than probably anything in the business. You want yep. something that's gonna work all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure these gentlemen can attest to that. Yeah. I think oh. that, I th oh, sorry, go on. Uh, sorry, I was just gonna say it's, uh, it, it's an amazing time uh, to record at home right now because um, uh, there are interfaces like the Focusrite uh, Mackie, again, Personas, a bunch of companies have them, um, and they all have different feature sets, although similar, but for 99 bucks, you can plug in one or two microphones and get that into USB in your computer and get a, a, a usable sound out of it. That's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. The, the one thing that I uh, <laughs> believe uh, is, is worthwhile uh, suggesting too, is that if you want something, if you want a microphone, to be using that microphone 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, then money, uh, spending the extra money, that's gonna, that's mm -hmm. gonna be uh, the thing. You know, uh, uh, w you know uh, Randy and I will have our U87s in our mic locker, you know, forever, tw 20 years from now, right? They're but being passed you, down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if you buy a four or $500 microphone, there's nothing because of build quality, probably Matthew, it's it's uh it's quite likely that that it's gonna have a, a, a you know if you're gonna use it a lot that it's only gonna last a certain number of years but spend the money and and you'll have something forever the only line you get what you pay for is yeah. not a fable folks and yeah. i learned that the hard way honestly with a lot of gear i mean all the stuff back here that i got is a lot of a lot of bad mistakes over the years buying stuff that oh yeah this is the latest and greatest and it was terrible and that included microphones but you know like i said i was trying to you know cheryl and i'm just talking about like you know i know people don't it, it's tough because you go into this business you're going to be spending money it's you know it, it's it's unfortunately the way it is and yeah i mean do you want to start off get some get your feet wet yeah but try your best to do something use get something that you will stick with you for a while. I completely agree with Andrew on that. So saying that part, right, I guess about halfway through, we were saying get something to record with. So at what point and when should you do an upgrade? When you have you money. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't come too quickly. <laughs> I mean, I I think I've, if you're pa I think if you're passionate about singing and you're passionate about music and passionate about recording and you can see yourself doing it 10 years from now, 20 years from now, then you know, then maybe save a little bit extra money, borrow a little bit or whatever, but buy something that's going to last for a long long time. So I would say that. I'm uh, I'm conscious that I'm a I'm a gearhead and and the other folks are on the on the on the caller as well and uh, to my chagrin not all of my customers are quite as deeply passionate about buying gear as I would like them to be. <laughs> so for a lot of artists, I think, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not reasonable for us to expect that they're just going to magically go out and want to upgrade all the time. Yeah. I think what you'll find as artists is uh, when you compare your productions to the stuff you hear on the radio, or as your career progresses and you're working with a producer who's done some other work of note, and then that person is giving you feedback that says, well, what did you record this with? Because when I went to mix it, you know, I was really struggling with this or that aspect of the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hearing this a lot now from, um, some, from my producer uh, clients and customers 
who don't have the ability to bring their artists into studios anymore because of the pandemic. And so Ooh. they're sending gear out for people to record at home and they're dealing with issues of what the room sounds like and, yeah. uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so as, as you, as your career as a musician and as an artist progresses and you, um, start working with people whose ears are more experienced, you'll get that feedback about whether you can upgrade your space and or your signal chain. Um, I don't know that it necessarily makes sense uh, to just, you know, go buy gear for the sake of buying gear. Yeah. Uh, there is a level uh, that you can quickly progress past. You know, if you're if you're using, uh, if you're singing into an iPhone, you know, you've got a lot of headroom there. Like in other words, you, there's a, a lot of easy upgrades to make. <laughs> but if you've got, if you've spent five hundred or eight hundred bucks on a mic and a and a preamp and a converter, you know. The difference between that and a five thousand dollar signal chain it's there but are you going to appreciate it for the cost you know you get you, you get to the point of diminishing returns relatively quickly mm. um and i you know i i agree uh with randy that some of these consumer grade devices are i mean they don't stand up to a really nice console or a really great preamp they can't because for 99 bucks i mean i showed this earlier uh this is an, an older Mackie mm. and it's completely competent, but, mm -hmm. uh, and for 99 bucks, it's, it's hard to beat, but it's, it doesn't stand up to something that costs 500 bucks a channel, even much less more than that. Um, I wouldn't let, if this is all I had, I wouldn't say, oh, I'm not going to bother recording because this doesn't sound good enough. Um, but $99 to get two pre's uh, and uh, converters uh, with USB into this little box uh, is amazing, but it means they had to take some shortcuts, you know, so, uh, so yeah, there are upgrades to be had, but I, I you know, I wouldn't get hung up on that. Um, I, I, I'm not going to tell you that you need to spend a thousand bucks to sound, uh, to get something you can use to sound good. Awesome. Randy, Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? I agree. I mean, like I said, you know, these interfaces, I, I mean, you can get one of these interfaces for a hundred, a hundred and a hundred and a half. And, uh, like a, a kid that I know is a drummer he was trying to start um, messing with recording it, recording drums and he's a great drummer. The kid's amazing. He's a jazz player and he's just, he's got such great instinct. And I said, well, the microphones, he got an Audix kit, drum, the mic drum kit. Now, is that the perfect thing for recording? No, but it's, I said, you're gonna start working. You're gonna have enough mics to mic the kit up, experiment work with aiming, change positions. And he got it on eBay, he got it used. And it's gonna give him, it's, I said, it's a starting, a nice starting platform that you can record. And then he ended up going with the A-channel Scarlet, I forgot what it is, you know, cause it was only 300 and it's like 350 bucks. It was like eight channels of pre. I was like, really? I, I saw it online and I was like, it's that cheap? So like for less than 500 bucks, he was able to get a full complement of drum microphones and an interface to, and he could start working and recording. Is that the best mics he's gonna use? No, but he's gonna learn on that. And he'll be able to go a little ways with that before he has to go shelling out more money. Yep. And he could probably get a pretty good result too. I haven't heard any of the stuff he's done yet, because, you know, his parents, the COVID thing, well, nobody can go to nobody's house, so. But, um, you know, he's wanting to learn. He's a young kid, he's in his early 20s. But, you know, I mean, for under 500 bucks, you can definitely get yourself in a position where you can produce, create music and do it relatively decently without, without sounding like it's coming out of your iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, this has been this has been absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for participating in this conversation. I think we've learned so much. Um, I think uh, I think people are taking notes. <laughs> I think that's what people are doing right now. And of course, if there are any more questions, we'll certainly um, forward them to you. But audience, I also want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, this has been awesome having you join us. Uh, together, I wish I could say, type in the chat, hand clap for um, Andrew, Andrew Horrocks for being here, 
for Randy Hitz and for Matthew McGlynn. Thank you so much guys for being here. Thank you for being here, for sharing that experience. Please remember that we are going to be taking this uh, conversation and putting it on our YouTube channel. So we will put a post up when that is ready. But for now, we just want to say thank you. And remember the Gospel Music Industry Hub is here to encourage unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth. We're signing off now, but we'll be back next week. Bye for now.